welcome to our virtual stage, Professor Paul Eakins from University College London. Paul, I'm going to stop talking because everybody's heard too much from me already today and I'm going to pass the, the platform straight across to yourself. So everybody, please put your hands together for the fabulous Paul. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, impossible to have too much of you, I would say. So, um, and that's a very nice summary of where, where we've where, where you've got to over the last day, and indeed over the past few years. Let me um, start by saying where I'm coming from, because I think that's always helpful. Um, I'm professor of resources and environmental policy, so I'm interested in practically anything to do with sustainable development. But it's very recently that I got into the minerals and raw materials area. Um, I became a member of UNEP's International Resource Panel, which is a group of about 30 experts worldwide who look into all manner of resources um, and seek really to be the resource equivalent of the IPCC or the Biodiversity Panel IPBES. And uh, I was a co-author on the IRP report uh, that was published in 2020 called Mineral Resource Governance. And we were looking at what, uh, well, how uh, the extraction of minerals uh, around the world proceeds from a governance perspective, um, who runs it, who benefits from it, and how can it be improved. I, I think the first thing I learned from that was that uh, it's very difficult to make generalizations because practically any generalization you come up with, there are exceptions. So um, everything I say in these 10 minutes, that should be borne in mind that there will be exceptions to what I say. But I, I think what I'm going to say is, is broadly right. And um, I, I, I learned that trust is indeed really important uh, in the extraction of minerals, but that it is in very, very short supply. And that's because trust, uh, it became obvious to me, is built on uh, one or both of two uh, foundations. It's either built on shared interest. In other words, you trust each other because it's better for you to trust each other than not. And, and you trust that the other person, other party, other stakeholder will deliver because um, but it, it, they know your interest is built on that and you know their interest is built on that. Or you trust each other because of deeply shared um, values. And um, I'm going to look very briefly at both those possible sources of trust in the few minutes that I've got. And as I say, the IRP report made it very clear that there's not a lot of this commodity about and whether you look at mining companies or host governments or local communities, uh, by and large, they don't trust each other. By and large, each of the other uh, is looking to get as much as they can for themselves out of this particular arrangement. And they all feel that the others uh, are getting more than their fair share. And indeed, I became aware of a term called unequal exchange, which is that perception that uh, you're in a, uh, an exchange relationship which isn't working for you in a fair way. And um, uh, too often it became clear that mining companies do not respect local communities' legitimate interests, that host governments do not respect mining companies' financial imperatives. And the result is that uh, there is a kind of three-way mistrust, mutual suspicion, uh, very often leading to conflict. Uh, it's interesting that what Sarah was saying earlier, a lot of emphasis was clearly given to transparency. And to me, that is always the number one precondition for any kind of trust to be built. Um, in my most recent work for the International Resource Panel, uh, I've been looking at the most recent or last year's version of the Responsible Mining Index, which seems to me to be a pretty good piece of research work at the level at which it needs to be conducted, namely at the site level. And what becomes very apparent if you look at that splendid piece of work uh, is that uh, many companies are trying 
Um, but uh, there is enormous room for improvement across whichever aspect of sustainable development uh, you care to look. And a particularly interesting way of presenting the data from that report was that uh, by and large, most companies on the index that they'd constructed scored less than 50%, uh, or most sites scored less than 50% across these various dimensions. Uh, if all the companies had performed on each dimension according to uh, the best practice that some companies had achieved on their sites, then the uh, overall score would have gone up from below 50% to above 80%. And that seems to me to show uh, the scope of what is possible because those were performances that were actually being achieved in real life mining situations. Coming back then to this, um, these, these, the possibility of building trust on these deeply held shared values, where might that come from? I, I think where we are at the moment, and this is what we discovered in the IRP's resource governance report was that we're sort of at the social license to operate stage, which I would characterize as a more or less grudging acceptance by mining companies that they have to pay rather more attention than perhaps they always have in the past to the legitimate aspirations of host countries and local communities if they want to mine without conflict. And uh, this conflict, of course, uh, is very evident. You've only got to look at the Environmental Justice Atlas on the web to see just how many mining-related conflicts there are around the world. Um, but very often this social license to operate or the attempt to gain that does not build trust. As I say, it comes across as a kind of grudging acceptance by the different parties, but the suspicions remain and so often do the conflicts and we try to move on in our report to a, a, a much deeper concept uh, which we call the sustainable development license to operate in the hope that this might provide a basis for the shared values on which all stakeholders could move forward and this goes beyond the social license to operate uh, because it uh, entails a commitment all round to contribute to the sustainable development of local communities. Full transparency, information about the operations from companies, and to give credibility to this commitment that they are indeed walking the talk and doing what they say they're intending to do, and sharing the value creation in minerals extraction with the host country, with the local communities, in a way that's recognised as fair, both nationally and locally, uh, respects local values and rights, protects local environments, and entails the use of resources by host governments that uh, promote sustainable development. And again, we're all aware of governments where, in which sustainable development doesn't appear to be a very strong, uh, a very strong uh, notion. And, and we were encouraged in our belief that this might be possible to move towards that kind of shared perception of value by, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals universally agreed at the UN level um, and uh, have uh, generated an enormous amount of momentum towards uh, sustainable development uh, in many, many countries and could provide the basis for deeply held shared values out of which trust might emerge. So that was sort of 2020. And since then, I've been involved in another piece of work for the IRP, uh, looking at the financing of minerals extraction, particularly in the context of these things called critical minerals. And Sarah uh, mentioned right at the beginning, you know, how that debate has emerged. And there are really two important elements to this criticality. Uh, the first is that those countries that have now got uh, legally mandated decarbonization targets recognize that if they are to meet those targets, they're going to have, have to get access to these minerals on a historically unprecedented scale and level. 
um, for the, the decarbonizing technologies that uh, Sarah referred to right at the beginning. But secondly, we're now in a very, very different world uh, geopolitically to the one that we were in before the pandemic and a recognition that these supply chains through which these critical minerals go are incredibly complex and they go through many different countries and many different places, not all of which uh, are friendly uh, to various uh, different countries for different purposes. And obviously that was brought home to us by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and sudden realization just how dependent we were for a number of uh, particularly energy resources in this case, but also uh, mineral resources, um, non-energy mineral resources uh, for uh, our own economic well-being. So that gives the developed world in which, of course, uh, many of the big mining companies are located in terms of their headquarters, that gives the developed world a huge interest in securing access to these minerals. And um, that really leads to two options. Uh, we can either uh, go, go again to the kind of exploitative extractivism that was characteristic of the imperial era and just open another phase in that, which will be um, a phase of conflict, certainly, um, and uh, obviously deeply unfair uh, exchange. And uh, it's interesting to see Andy Whitmore here because uh, I organized a talk at UCL just recently with Javier Gordon, who's the Latin American coordinator uh, of the London Mining Network. And um, uh, she gave us an, a fantastic account, both historically of the development of the extractivist culture through imperial times, but also the danger that that extractivist culture is simply being repeated now in this new context of the need to access um, uh, critical materials. Or we can go to uh, a recognition of, of mutual interest, uh, interest in behalf of the uh, currently industrialized world, um, interest in securing these minerals on a secure basis, uh, which can only be won on the basis of, of trust uh, and uh, shared interest for the sustainable development of the uh, mining countries, uh, both in terms of their governments and their local communities. And uh, it's the uh, way in which the finance sector can facilitate that, that uh, that's what we're currently working on uh, at the IRP. And um, I've just finished the first draft of that report, so it'll be going through peer review uh, in the course of the next few months. And uh, I guess that's my main hope as to where this trust may eventually come from. Uh, a deeply shared mutual interest in getting access to these minerals, but a recognition that we will not manage that from the side of the industrial countries if we don't pay far more attention to shared value, to local communities, to local environments, to indigenous rights, uh, to human rights more generally, um, because it's quite clear to me that the uh, countries where these minerals are, uh, are not simply going to uh, uh, lie back and allow them to be extracted in the kind of exploitative way which happened all too often in the past. And I'm afraid it's quite clear that it's still happening today. So um, in order for that to happen, there will need to be uh, a, an enormous increase in capacity uh, in many developing countries, um, some of which lack the basic institutions to ensure uh, equality of exchange, the geological surveys, the mining directorates in the governments, the environmental agencies that can actually um, hold uh, mining companies to account for their operations uh, and ensure that enough money is put aside for uh, responsible closure. Uh, and all that uh, is going to have to be financed by the consuming com uh, countries, which are the rich countries of the world. So minerals are not going to be as cheap as they were. And the money that uh, is going to have to be paid for them is going to have to be used for the genuine sustainable development of the countries that 
supply them. Uh, and indeed, the governments that get that money uh, will need to spend it for those purposes. Um, and that means that the minerals themselves are going to be very different to what they have been in the past, uh, where the mining uh, and minerals have been characterized as sort of supreme commodities. A ton of copper is a ton of copper is a ton of copper, no matter where it comes from or how it's been produced. And that will have to change. Uh, the technology is now there for it to change in terms of traceability. Um, uh, and again, we come back to that absolute priority of transparency uh, and the provision of information. So the only way in which the trust that we're looking for can be built will be on the basis of those kinds of mutual interest arrangements um, going forward between all the different stakeholders. So I've probably said enough, Sarah, I hope, to have simulated some questions either from you or from other panelists or indeed from anyone who um, is, happens to be listening to, to this online. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I've, I personally have been scribbling away because you've been triggering all kinds of ideas as you've given us that introductory talk. So a massive round of applause to yourself. Thank you so much. Um, so with regards to questions, and you're correct, there have been many comments flying around behind the scenes. And I think um, the, the, the first one is, a, is so it's a question that I get asked on a regular basis, which is horrible but I'm going to throw it at you anyway, which is everyone, you know, everybody tends to agree and says, yes, we need to be able to move towards um, a system of mutual interest. So away from that exploitative extraction and everybody agrees that, yes, this is what we need to, to make happen. But a lot of people then say, no, but you're deluded. It's never going to work because our capitalist system, et cetera, keeps on pushing forwards the fact that those mining companies, et cetera, need to make money for their shareholders. Now, I know that you've begun to peel back the lid of what might be coming in your report. Do you have any initial advice with regards to how do you how do you how do you reply to that particular question where somebody says, lovely idea, but you're deluded? <laughs> well, um, I, I mean, I, let, let me go back to kind of the basics. I didn't say at the beginning, I'm, I'm an economist. And so I try to understand these economic matters. Um, and the one thing that anyone who studied environmental economics knows is that markets do this very badly. Um, so it's even called an externality, all these environmental effects that we experience, because they're outside markets unless governments put them inside markets. And that is the crucial role of government to ensure that these non-market effects uh, are fully taken into account. And at the moment, of course, we don't even begin to do that. And if we start to do that in the mining industry, the first thing we will get is this decommoditization uh, that I was talking about. And that is a fundamental reform of the market for minerals. And that will have to come about if we're going to be interested in taking these matters into account, because if a mining company produces minerals in a sustainable way and they are more expensive than the minerals of their competitors, which would be the case today, then they will go bust. They will lose their capital, their shareholders will go elsewhere and that won't happen. Um, we're beginning to move towards an awareness of the need to moderate market forces in this way. So the European Commission has plans for a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which seeks to take carbon into account. And we will have to have, in my view, and I must stress this is my personal view rather than the IRP, because our report hasn't yet uh, gone through its peer review processes. In my view, we will need a raw materials adjustment mechanism to enable markets to take those things into account without getting um, uh, competitively uh, disadvantaged. And uh, you mentioned Minister Nusrat Ghani right at the beginning. I'm afraid the UK has an appalling record in this area because although they talk a good talk about um, having trade that is sustainable, um, and this is particularly with regard to the agricultural trade deals, which we have struck already with Australia and New Zealand, there is nothing in those trade deals that allows for standards of food production. 
And that's despite the fact that the government has said uh, repeatedly that, that it is going to take those non-market effects into account. It simply has not done so. So it's a classic case of not walking the talk, of talking uh, a, a, a good message, but then not uh, bringing, uh, putting that into effect. And until we get serious about moderating market forces in that way, then Sarah, yes, we will be deluded and we will not achieve those kinds of sustainable development processes in mining, uh, which our sustainable development license to operate idea was built on. So if there was a, a group or a kind of, you know, a stakeholder group that actually does hold a bigger lever with regards to this at the moment, would you say that that's governments rather than, say, companies or communities, etc.? I don't think any one of those three uh, important sets of stakeholders can do it by themselves. There are companies that want to move further and faster than they are doing in this area, but they can't because of competitive pressures. Um, there are governments uh, sometimes who are wedded to these kind of neoliberal ideas of free markets, which cannot solve these problems. And the local communities normally are the people with the least power. And the only power that they have is actually to engage in conflict and to stop the mining taking place. And that's what we're seeing around the world far, far too often. Uh, so this needs to be uh, an agreement based on mutual interests, whereby uh, the countries uh, and the communities uh, actually recognize what needs to be done. And the consuming countries uh, agree to pay the price for a sustainably mined mineral, which gives a decent return to the companies that operate in that way. And the host countries and communities keep a fair value of the shared value that is being created through that process. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Paul. So I think what we've done there is begin to see the sheer scale of the, the challenge and the complexities of the challenge that we're facing at the moment. And um, Paul, with regards to some maybe key takeaways, it's that mutual interest, that shared interest and in those shared values and people being willing to actually face up to the fact that this is going to be really, really hard in sure. many different aspects. So everyone, please put your hands together for the fabulous Professor Eakins. Thank you very much, Paul. Round of applause. Excellent.